Oh. Okay. And what, what I was going to, do, to read is, um, I want to read the introduction that was written. Um, I had it written, it's the only thing that I did in dialogue. Dialogue is a pain in the Watusi to write, so I didn't want to write the whole book in dialogue. Um, but I did want to capture the accent that my family and I grew up with, and when I'm tired, I default to this accent. Um, so this is just talking about the Piedmont, uh, the area where I grew up, um, even though this is a fictional town. The Piedmont. The writer of this here book asked me to tell you about some things to get this book to rolling. First of all, I want y'all to remember I ain't no writer. I'm from the country though, and I can tell some tales. Who else better than a local to tell somebody about a place in the South? Writers like to dress places up and make them places all nice and pretty. If you want to know the truth though, ask the country folk. They'll tell you right. If nothing else, they're filled with enough fire and brimstone preaching to make sure to tell the truth. I also told the writer not to correct the spelling on her computer for my part. When she read it back to me the first time, it sounded like some city slicker. Now the Piedmont begins near about 30 to 40 minutes east-northeast of Charlotte. It's according to where you're going, really. We lived between Cabarrus and Stanley counties most of our life, hardly ever traveling anywhere. If we did, we always took Highway 49 to Charlotte or Ashboro. Sometimes we went to camp in the Uwari National Forest. Mountaineers would say that old range looks more like hills than mountains. <laughs> Still, the Uwaris are older than the Blue Ridge Mountains. Anyhow, once you leave the city on Highway 49, there are miles and miles of farmland. Many would say miles and miles of nothing, but to country folk, those are miles and miles of heaven. Purdy rolling farmland and pastures that make you dream. So that tells you about the where of this story. Now, um, what else did she want me to tell you? Oh yeah, a little bit, just a little bit about when the story happened. Bill Clinton was president and it was time before the folks were trying to impeach him. Now that was quite a time. <coughs> That's when me and Nanny decided to move closer to the city. We moved in the summer too and oh, we was a summer of 1997, a hot one. Okay, so all the summers in the South were hot. How hot it feels to a person is according to how much stress life gives or if you got hay to bail or fields to plow. At about 480 feet elevation, the Piedmont is a hot box of humidity in the summer and breezes rarely blow. You gotta remember, west of here, the Blue Ridge Mountains are 5,000 feet or higher in comparison. That's why we're called the Foothills. Now, some consider the Piedmont over near Raleigh, but them folks I grew up with saw that just as another big old city. The Piedmont means foothills, and Raleigh is not near the foothills of anywhere I can tell. Maybe Raleigh's near the foothills hills of the Uwaris, but like I said, they ain't that big. Anyways, I'm getting off the story. Now the writer tells me I'm in the wrong season. Still, you can't know how good it feels in a Piedmont fall unless you know how hot the summers get. Some folks that cuss say it's hotter than H-E-double-L or Hades. Every day is like one natural steamer after another. My mom and daddy always got up at five o'clock in the morning to get their chores done before it got too hot. Then they would sit on the porch after lunch drinking iced tea like summer would drag on forever. You couldn't wait till September came. Of course, when, while September cooled off some, the heat would still come around. Now that I think about it, September is a lot like a menopausal woman. <laughs> a lot of hot flashes in between the cool spaces. We couldn't wait till October, or better yet, November when it was sure to cool down a bit. I can't remember exactly what was popular in country music in 1997. I liked All My Exes Lived in Texas by George Strait. Don't tell my wife though, she thinks it encourages the sin of D-I-V-O-R-C-E. I can't rightly recollect the exact years of songs, so that might be wrong. It was hard to listen to the radio on my combine much when I was in the fields. Nanny only wanted, wanted to play gospel on the old radio when I was in the house. As you can tell, 
I might wear the pants in the house, but I ain't the one in charge. She's a good woman, though. Neither one of us likes that bumpy, jumpy music. This story, this, the story this here writer is about to tell you is set in the country. She hopes that by my reading the introduction, you can get a sense of how most everybody talks. Those that went to college might try and talk more formal. There are always country folk that try to act like they something they ain't. Maddie wasn't like that. She could talk with the city slickers and then just as easy fall back into the brogue of Pleasant Quarry. She's proof that just because a young and got education, there's no need to get on a high horse or get too big for your britches. There's one more thing to remember. In 1997, it was still a bit dangerous in the rural areas of the South to admit that you might be a homosexual, most often pronounced homosexual in that time. If you lived in the country, the KKK could still sneak into the areas back there with all the back roads. In fact, we heard them hollering over the hill behind our house one night. There were a few people you could talk to and be honest about your life, but you had to be very careful. Me and Nanny got tired of that secrecy and fear, so we finally up and moved to the city when we retired. It's easier to hide here. We still miss the country, though. Those beautiful mornings with the birds singing or the sound of rain on the old tin roof. You can take the women out of the country, but you really can't take the country out of the women. So um, that's my introduction. and. Um, that is a lot <laughs> how my family talked. When I first went to college, people called me the hick from Big Lick uh, because I was uh, from the country and uh, I had to, and there were a lot of northerners at Pfeiffer and uh, so I had to learn how to talk so that the people from New York and New Jersey could understand me. <laughs> and then when I went back to Big Lick, North Carolina, they'd call me, you're getting fancy like them city slickers. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, you can't win. So you had to learn how to talk to one way over here and one way over there. Um, and so I had hoped in the introduction to give kind of a feel for uh, the character, because one character tries to do that. And uh, one of my readers said, this, this character is changing the way she talks. And I'm like, oh, that's right, you're not raised in the, <laughs> you're not raised in the South. And I say that because a lot of Southerners, have, uh, in, I've had a lot of my friends say, yes, you know, I try to watch my accent because people will think that if you've got a Southern accent, uh, you ain't bright. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that's one of the things I really appreciate about Ron Rash when he does his readings. He doesn't care about his accent. I'm like, go Ron. Uh, I'm not that brave yet, and I'm not that uh, big of a writer. So. Um, I was going to say, uh, listen to Lee Smith. Mm -hmm. Oh, I haven't heard any of Lee Smith's uh, talks. Well, yeah. She's a great reader. And she also, of course, she's Southwest Virginia. But so still it's a little same, different. It's but, still yeah. the same thing, still the same con uh, concept, too. Um, yes, and I love Lee Smith's books. And uh, one of the things I actually hoped to do in my book is catch, capture that Southern feel. Like, uh, now, I, uh, I'm, I'm not as good a writer as Lee Smith, of course. That's what I was telling uh, David and Jeanette and uh, her a moment ago. That in comparison to my first two books, my, uh, my new novel is fluff. <laughs> and, uh, and I say fluff because it's an easy read. You're not going to have to do any big soul searching. Uh, my hope is that it captures a South that um, people don't often see. And it's the reason I love the South. And even though I've moved away from North Carolina several times, I always come back and find, I'm just going to stay here, so I don't have to keep moving back. Um, but I, I wanted to, I talked to Chris, I wanted to also talk about this book, just, just briefly. This is uh, Brene, is it Brene or Brene Brown's book? Brene with that accent. Brene, okay, Brene Brown, uh, Braving the Wilderness. She's one of my favorite authors anyway, but she, is, she comes about belonging uh, from a sociologist's point of view, and this is a wonderful book, and lucky for y'all, I lost my copy that was highlighted so many times of stuff I was going to make y'all listen to me read. Uh, but what I really love about her book here is, um, is how it goes along with what I was actually wanting to do in my fiction book, uh, in particular, um, her chapter that says, The Quest for True Belonging. 
and how she talks about it being a, a need for all human beings. And so if you get a chance to read the Brené Brown and like the more in-depth sociologist point of view, this is a really powerful book. And I like this book because she talks about how we need one another and how important it is that we learn to talk to one another even though we're different. So, and that's coming about it from a sociologist point of view. Now, I'm gonna hold up this book right quick. Now, my book, <laughs> I actually wrote it because I wanted people to see that gays and lesbians could live in a community of regular people and have a fine, beautiful, powerful life. And that uh, the South is not full of just KKK people or, or bigots. Uh, and sometimes even the bigots have heart. <laughs> Uh, do you know what I'm saying? I, I don't want to. I'm trying. I'm not trying to. I suddenly brought that word in there, and I didn't want that kind of talk here. I want it to be about the fact that we can all get along and have a wonderful, wonderful life. Um, we're at City Lights Bookstore, and Kit City Lights Cafe is right below us. And one of my favorite things that they've got it says, "Love your community." And one of the things I love about this place, this community here, is all the different people we have and you know everybody, and you love everybody, and you get along. And if you don't get along, you just have an argument, and then you go on your own way. <laughs> and it's just been beautiful to see how this community works together. And when I started writing this, I started writing it 20 years ago, <laughs> maybe 30 years ago. Oh, I'm not that old. Maybe 30 years ago, um, because I wanted to write a book that was a, about my life, and then I'm like, oh, my life is so boring. No wonder nobody's ever written this book. It's because it's boring, because I'm just like everybody else in the world. And then I had some crazy stuff happen in my life. And I'm like, well, sometimes boring is comforting. And so that's the approach I'm taking this. You can have a comfortable, wonderful life, working through your hardships with friends and families and neighbors. And uh, you can just have a good life as a community. And we can build those communities together. Um, I, I don't. I'm, I'm nervous, more nervous than I expected to be. I think because this is fiction and, and uh, fluff. Uh, do you have questions, thoughts, or? I was just going to say, you know, it's been my experience, and in the the book that you've heard pieces of mm -hmm. that I'm working on, that we work on in our writers group. Um, I have a, a character, you know, similar to what you're talking about, who is. Um, one of the one of the positive uh, male characters in the book, and uh, he's based on someone I knew years ago uh, in Dahlonega, Georgia. My experience of small towns in the South has been that as long as you were local, you could be pretty eccentric. Yeah, you could be pretty out there. <laughs> oh, and people would stick up for you because you might be odd to them, but you were theirs. That's right. You know? That's right. And, uh, you know, I mean, and we're talking about, you know, experiences that I had, you know, geez, talk about how long ago it was now, you know, <laughs> over 35 years ago in, uh, in northern Georgia, you know, um, where there were people in the community, you know, who were gay, there were people in the community who were, uh, you know, of other races or, had uh, odd uh, spiritual beliefs, you know, and mm -hmm. everybody just kind of winked an eye at it. They're like, oh yeah, you know, that's him. <laughs> <laughs> but they, you know, they, they were not <laughs> negative or, or um, you know, attacking or, uh, and things have changed, I guess, but um, it would be hopeful to, to think that we could get back to that small town mindset where as long as you, as long as you're one of us, you're just one of us, and you may be different. Maybe you're just become one of us. Of yeah. Yeah. Well, and I believe that we can. I believe that yeah. we can, and that's why I got so excited about Brandy Brown's book because it's like I was writing this because I believe that we can, and then I have proof now. Brandy Brown, <laughs> associate, <laughs> has got proof that this would work. You know, I, I'm sorry that's that's taking it too far, but I I agree. I think that. I think we, the thing is that we have more in common than we have uh, separate. And, and uh, when she was talking about unusual characters, uh, the, first, the, the first person brave enough to um, 
reading my book, my first draft, which was really rough, and she came back and told me I had to cut that, I need to cut that, that uh, character named Bo in my book because there is nobody like that. And I said, oh, that is so funny because that's the only one that's a real true person because that was my daddy. <laughs> <laughs> So if you read if you're reading this book, the character of Bo is based upon my dad, and he did do these. Uh, he he lived with my mother until he died, but uh, as far as building a car made of plaster, Paris, all that other stuff, that's all him. <laughs> uh, being chased down by Saint Bernard, yep, that's a real story. So. Um, so the, the, he's the only uh, base uh, person is just really pretty much taken straight off the character characteristics of my dad. Um, well, you it, know, Flannery O'Connor said, if you're from the South, you don't have to make anything up. That's right. Well, you know, um, a friend that knows me and my family was reading it and was trying to figure out who was who and said, well, I think that's that person and that's that person and that's that person. And so what you do is you just take those people apart and put those <laughs> mini pulse uh, personalities somewhere else and you got a whole, a whole slew of characters <laughs> just from one person. Um, but I'll, I'll, I'm going to tell you about the artist right quick. Uh, I'm really just delighted with this cover. Um, and it is done by uh, the artist Jennifer Lynn. Uh, the first cover I had for this book did not go with the book, and it, I just I hated it. And uh, I had seen Jennifer Lynn's uh, art on Facebook, and I said, I just, you know, joking around with I said, boy, I wish you'd do me a cover for my book. And she said, okay. I said, I can't pay you. She said, oh, you pay me whenever you can, uh, but it's okay. Don't worry about it right now. I want to do it. And I'm like, okay. My mother always said, if it's free, take it. And if somebody's willing to work, work with you, take it. And she was willing to work with me. And um, at the time, I was still finishing up the very last draft, so she had not read the book. I just gave her a, a synopsis of what I, where I was going with the book. And when she showed me this painting, it was unbelievable because not only does it capture the feel of the town uh, that I've created here, but this looks like my grandmother Poplin's house. And she didn't see any pictures. This is just what she came up of her own. And uh, later on, I found out that this artist that I was brave enough to ask is not only a, a good artist and intuitive artist, she's also uh, part of the Federation of Canadian Artists that was started by Emily Carr, and you have to be invited. And so I, it just gives me cold chills just thinking about Jennifer Lynn did my cover. Um, <laughs> so even if you don't uh, get a copy of this book, I hope you'll take one of these cards just for the beauty of, the, of her art. And uh, if you want a painting done, she'll do a painting for you. And uh, she's really an amazing artist. And I was trying to think if there seemed like there's something else I wanted to cover. But now, again, I'm nervous and excited and can't think. Do you have questions? Dottie, statements, or? Well, I can give another statement which goes along with yeah. uh, Jeanette's, is that growing up in Silva, having been born here local, uh, I had somebody the other night that said, kind of surprised because they didn't know it, they said, you're local, local, local. I said, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but my dad was from Wisconsin. I got away, I was an eccentric child. Am I eccentric adult? Yeah. <laughs> uh, but I got away with so much because if it was something that people didn't quite get, they'd say, well, you know her daddy's a Yankee. <laughs> <laughs> um, when I came back here, uh, I had some trouble with uh, some of my contemporaries because I was divorced and they were birth of babies about the same time and that was kind of I guess I was considered some kind of a threat though I have no idea why and then later after I came out uh, nobody seemed to have a problem when I became the Jackson County librarian there was a small group that were actually encouraged by uh, a couple of preachers in one community that had something to say and when they were reassured that I was not going, that I really didn't have a gay agenda, 
<laughs> they, I never heard another <clears throat> thing. And the fact that I was made to feel quite loved as the Jackson County librarian, while I was openly uh, not just gay, but partnered and then later married and made no thing about it in this teeny tiny town where you know her daddy was Yankee. <laughs> <laughs> you were one, of, you were also like the second couple to get married in Jackson County, or you were no, the first? No, we were married in, um, we were married in Maine over a oh, year yes. before. Okay. Okay. But once it became legal in North Carolina for, it's a crazy story that I won't tell you all of, but we happened to be at the Register of Deeds office to make sure that our marriage in Maine was now legal in North Carolina. And we hit the door for that on Monday before they even opened. <laughs> and we had a friend who was coming, a uh, minister, to, if we weren't, because we'd already had a blessing ceremony, we'd already had a marriage, we did not need another ceremony to just make it legal in the hall. Mm -hmm. And um, anyway, we're sitting there, and two acquaintances of ours came in, and they were the first people. Anyway, Joe Hamilton had assured me very lovingly that we didn't have a problem. And we were actually waiting for a friend because we were going to go have breakfast. And uh, this, these acquaintances of ours came in because they wanted to get the first license. And I said, you know, we've got a minister coming. You want to get married? They said, well, we got to go to church. And I said, well, she should be here in a few minutes. And uh, they said, yeah, let's do it. Well, the people at the registrar's office, because we were just going to get it done in the hall, you know, no problem. They said, no, 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 that's too dark and whatever. Go downstairs where the old books are and we'll show you where the books of the marriage licenses are and get married in front of that. Oh, wow. Oh, no. And it happened that um, Quentin Ellison had asked that uh, the somebody, if they were the first couple, to let her know. Well, we called and she couldn't get here right then, but she sent Nick Breedlove who did an amazing video that he posted on their Facebook for a while made me cry. And then Quentin got there, got pictures, and I was crying, and she had it in the paper that I was sobbing. And I just <laughs> Quentin overkill. She does that to me. But anyway, she said, oh, I, she said, why? And I said, because I never thought, I, I said, I remember Stonewall, which I do very well. and. I never thought I would live to see a same-sex marriage in Jackson County. So we were the witnesses to the yeah. first marriage, but we'd been married, as had a lot of people who'd gone out of state for quite some time. But, uh, but I'm sure that you had people in this community who even supported you in that. And, and I think that in what I want to do in this finding home is, uh, is we all belong. Exactly. You know, and one of the things that I love in a, um, I was almost going to make y'all watch a video, and then I thought that's too much. Uh, but Brittany Brown says, in writing this book, she realized I belong to myself, and she said, if you look out in the world expecting not to belong, you can always find that. But if you decide you belong to yourself, and you live where you are, and you belong to yourself, you will always belong. And. Um, and that's what, I, I, I don't know that I do it in this book, but that's my goal. Uh, it, it, I'm writing a series, uh, starting with this one, and this is kind of introduce the town and the characters. And then I hope to, you know, go on about this idea of belonging. What does it mean to belong together? And I love that story, uh, Dottie, because you, you told us the history of a community, of living in a community. And what it means to get to know the newspaper people and, and, and know uh, the preachers and the teachers and just the register all. Register of Deeds. The Register say. of Deeds. And all. Oh, hi! Come on in, have a seat over here. Um, <laughs> yay, another person from the writers group. Um, well, so we're just talking about belonging and. Um, the power of community, that's the, so that's what we're talking about. 
that just walked in the door comes from the county where I grew up. And so here we are weaving stories together about belonging and, and ownership. Um, and do you mind if I mention your, your uh, this is Laura that's here, and uh, Lauren has worked with hospice. And one of the things that I hope to interweave into these stories that I'm doing is the importance of death and life in our cycles of being and how they affect our belonging to one another. Um, a dear friend of mine had died, and um, I was very sad about it, and then found out her funeral was going to be before this event. And I told the pastor at first, I, I don't think I can come because I'll have to be, you know, have some kind of professionalism. But then I thought, no, because what, what I hope to do in this book, and I would love to have y'all com you know, communicate back with me if you read the book, about what you think would make it even better. Because death is a part of life. And Joe, the person's funeral that I ended up going to, because I thought, if I cry here, I cry here. This is a good town. These are good people. And death is very much a part of this sense of belonging. You know, if we don't have that birth of the babies and the love of the children to keep us laughing and also separate, I mean, celebrate the life of the people passing on, our life is empty. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. It's so wonderful to see you because I, I was just uh, telling the, those of you who might be watching live that, you know, I'm in this town which, which is a, my adopted town, but then you're from my home, my neck of the... Uh, yeah, so when you read this book, you're going to recognize parts of the book because um, it's a mixture of Cabarrus and Stanley County, uh, which is where we're from. No, you were raised in Norwood, is that right? Um, Baden and Albemarle. Baden and Albemarle. And I had to figure out when this one got accepted to an art school. Oh, wonderful. But um, by the grace of all things, ended up at Western Carolina University in 1990. Mm. So you got to come to the Holy Land, too. <laughs> <laughs> that was how I started. And fell in love with it and then came back and brought this one with me later on in life. I wrote my sister, my poetry sister, Jeanette Camus, and her husband, David. And that's the history. Um, she got it done. No, no, was, yeah, uh, but you were nominated for your acting awards in Olivia, weren't you? Yeah, so, and Natasha. Yeah. And, and Natasha, Natasha. okay. okay. <laughs> yeah. So uh, we've got a group of talented people here, um, and we've got several writers. I mean, because these uh, I've written with these three, and uh, I know Dottie's got her own uh, uh, theological uh, talents as well as uh, books, and then. Um, Jenny. 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 Oh, Jenny. oh my, my head's like, and Jenny, Jenny is, well, I think of her as my spiritual uh, friend because uh, she's such a wise soul. Uh, she's got some good ideas for writing, too. I hope you're still following through with that. And Chris is the owner of the bookstore. We got actors and the talented welder, guitarist, storyteller. <laughs> and Mildred, I, you're, I know you less, I mean least, uh, but we're glad you're here. I know you sing. Uh, so, no, I really don't. I just manage the group. <laughs> uh, well, that's, that's, I've managed a group of singers them. before, and they say that's like <laughs> managing cats, and that's about right. I'm so, a retired first and second grade remedial reading teacher. Oh, well, that's a talent <laughs> in itself. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, we've got talented writer in Jeanette, and an, oh, the awesome singer is holding the phone for me. And she does not write. 
Oh, well, but you sing. You I can like to sing, read. So, um, but anyway, I mostly just wanted to talk about community. I, I, whenever I do these, I always feel more, more like a facilitator because I want to hear your input on what you like to read and, you know, what you don't like to read. Um, but I, um, I just wanted to try my hand at fiction, and I'll admit it was fun. Read some more. Yeah. Well, um, before you start, though, I can't forget Lauren. She was my supervisor in hospice and a gifted counselor. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh, I thought yeah. I had started there. I'm, I might have not said it good. Uh, so, yeah, she's a gifted counselor, and uh, the work in hospice is a, an invaluable work. She was, um, I'm a hospice volunteer, and she was the one that introduced me and trained me for the, to be a hospice volunteer. Yeah, and I won't get on that set of books, but I really love these hospice people because we need to learn to re, re-accept, I'm going to say, the place of death as part of life, not as something separate than. It's just the natural circle exactly. of life. It's, you know, you look at a tree, it dies, it goes to the ground, and it comes back as something else. And um, we will, I'm not talking to religious, I'm just talking about the cycle of life. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I'll, see if I can, I'll see if I can find a Buford story right quick. Uh, he, he's Bo in here, though. Um, um, one of the things, uh, the reason that I did, um, by the way, I did the self-publishing thing is because uh, it's fluff. And I, I wanted to write a book uh, like I wanted it to be. And um, a lot of people wanted me to put sex in here, and I just didn't want to do that. I am, <laughs> by nature, a religious person. That's another reason I'm boring as far, <laughs> as, far as it concerns uh, writing stuff. You know, people want you to write this all this sex stuff, and uh, that's just not my thing. <laughs> um, May I rephrase something? Sure. You talk about it being fluff, and I understand the fluff, but how about saying it's fluff with content? Oh, I like that. I might have to steal that. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, I'm going to try this one. This, this is not something my dad actually did, um, but um, I call it Bosix Guidance. Well, that's kind of like him. All right, Maddie was surprised when she opened a door and found Bo stand, standing there. Howdy, I was about to knock. Thought I would invite you to lunch. Let's go down to the Whataburger, said Bo. That was a surprise. Bo had never asked her to lunch before. What's up, Bo? questioned Maddie. Bo looked down at his shoes and shuffled his feet around while Maddie locked her back door. Maddie could sense the nervous, nervousness in Bo and was certain she had never seen him this nervous before. Finally, Bo mumbled, I want to talk to you about this woman I met. She's nice, but she does something called yoga. <laughs> and I want to make sure it ain't nothing bad, you know, like that satanic junk. I can't exactly talk to my daughters about this. Maddie tried not to laugh as she visualized Bo dating a person open-minded enough to practice yoga. Now she understood why Bo was at her door. He didn't want to worry his daughter about dating someone other than her mom. And Bo also knew Maddie had lived in cities where he said hippies lived. Bo, let's compromise. I'll be glad to go to lunch with you today, but how about going to Joe's place instead? I need to check on Pearl. I wanted to hear how it went with the homeless people yesterday, and she's not answering her phone. It's a deal, Be uh, Bo breathed. He did not realize until that moment that he was holding his breath. He hated to ask the opinion of anyone, especially a woman, and worse, a lesbian. But Pearl always said that Maddie knew a lot about other religions. Pearl had gone on and on one time when her papa came for a haircut saying Maddie should have been a preacher if women could preach. Talking to Maddie was better than nothing. Yesterday he looked up yoga in his 1969 World Book Encyclopedias and he thought everything was okay but you never can be too sure when it comes to city slickers. Now the only thing he had to hope was that his buddies would not give him heck for having lunch with Maddie. It was the first time he had ever worried about his reputation.
I my, think you're selling yourself short on this book, Robin. Um, well, I think it will give you a laugh um, because I, I grew up in a small community uh, in the town of Big Lick, and I went to the church in Frog Pond. Wow. <laughs> I didn't know you were. Oh, wow. <laughs> that before you got the Red Cross, right? <laughs> That's right. She knows where it is. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And there's a place out there called Thumb. <laughs> um, finger. Yeah, Finger. Oh, yeah, Finger. <laughs> and Thumb Road. No, it really was. It was Finger, and then there was Thumb Road. That's right. It wasn't the finger, just finger. It's finger. No, just finger. Just finger. Just finger. Okay. That's like a big lick. Yeah. <laughs> and they have historic meanings, of course. I don't know finger. I don't want to know the meaning of the finger. But uh, big lick was a natural salt lick. Red cross used to be the, where the red roads cross was this red clay out there. Yeah, our grandparents ate. I mean, my grandmother ate the red clay. The red clay. Oh, wow. The pica. Yeah, yeah. The pica oh, yeah. was such a real thing when you're pregnant, so they ate the clay. Oh, how interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Wow. And then it went to starch, but that's a whole different Well, I, I heard about the starch thing because Mama used to do that. My mom used to eat the cake starch, but... Um, and down at Frog Pond, it was called Frog Pond because there used to be a frog pond down there. Uh, now it's just a big, it used to be some kind of mill. But anyway, so it's just, it's just a small community. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a different kind of community than the mountain community because I think that because of the, the Cherokee clans and the Scottish clans and the Irish clans, it's just a, just a different kind of atmosphere. It's a little bit, the boundaries of the... Um, Outsiders are a little bit more loose, but there's still that city slicker thing. That's a whole nother. <laughs> You're suspicious of all city <clears throat> slickers. Um, Around here, it would be, you're not from here. Yeah. <laughs> the other phrase, which I don't hear much anymore, is so and so is a furner. Oh, I've heard, I've heard from furners. Uh, um, I've heard that one before. Um, when I first moved up here, everybody said, "Who's your family?" Uh huh. That's what that's what they said to me because uh, because I had a unlike uh, Diane who had is from Chicago and had an accent. My accent was more like from around here, so they said, "Who's your family?" And because they knew it was different, but it was still southern, so I might be okay. <laughs> uh, we grew up um, we grew up in Miami, so that's a whole other kind of community, but. Mm -hmm. Dad is from a small town in West Texas. Um, wow. Uh, you know, probably about as big as Big Lick. Uh, probably, probably. Um, where he's still called Jimmy when he goes back by anybody who remembers him. And uh, Grandma grew up there, and so whenever she met someone new, she'd say, Who were your people? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. My people. I remember it was very distinctly said. And she'd ask that of anybody, but you know, if you came through Barrett, it was definitely who were your people. Mm -hmm. Did you experience that, Joy? Because you know Whitley is one of those places. Those are one of the names of Stanley County. You have the Uries, the Uries. The yeah, um, there's a lot of Whitleys out there. And I got, I got to think when you said that, um, I'm almost like, you know, that they like to make a joke about Southerners being married to their cousins. And the joke happened because a lot of it's true. <laughs> uh, because, you know, that when I was doing my family lineage, found out that my mother and dad were related like five generations to removed, uh, you know. But it's far enough back to not matter with the DNA, but you could suddenly see why they said that. But maybe they started saying, who are your people? Trying not to have that interbreeding is what I'm wondering. Yeah. Uh, because well, my mother still can give a lineage of so-and-so's family, and I'm like, Mom, I don't know the first person you started with, much less. Let's open the family Bible and check the connection. That's right. One of That's the right. things I find interesting uh, around here is how people will when they're talking about you know those kinship networks, uh, they link it to the actual like physical places in mm -hmm. the county, right? They'll say, "Oh yeah." Well, are you a? I can't think of a name right now to go with it. But are you a Candy Fork Smith or are you a Little Canada Smith? <laughs> <laughs> you know, because uh, yeah, never the twain shall meet, right? <laughs> That's right. Along those lines, uh, I'm a plot hound nut. And, uh, uh -huh. So I know my dog's grandmother comes from this kennel, and he's a brown, and his, mm -hmm. his name is Cletus. Mm 
and it's spelled C L Y D E T H, the Welsh spelling. Oh and wow! I said, uh, I said, Cletus, I said, how did you get a name like that? He said, well, he said, you know, he said, so many Browns around here were hooking up. Said, Daddy went over to Tennessee because we needed to start some outcrossing. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's too cute. But see, what's interesting about you saying Cletus is I had an uncle Cletus, and I always wonder where my grandmother got that name. And then, kind of, when we did the research, it looks like my family might be Welsh. Yeah. Uh, Welsh and so that <laughs> gives that gives me cold chills because there again we start seeing how things uh, come into the Carolinas and the South, where these families settled. Um, and so it, it ends up being really interesting. Um, any other thoughts? I mean, I just, uh, I, I, I like hearing your stories and see, this is, this is what the South is about to me, is the things that we talk about here. Yes, these are the, there are these side things where we have uh, hatred and stuff. Uh, and, and, you know, this is where um, I am coming from my experience, and I would love to hear how yours might be different sometime. Uh, it may be not. Um, but... Um, I, oh, I want us to uplift this loving community that we know, like these people right here that were sitting around laughing about what we grew up with. This is where we build good communities, and see, I feel like I belong to every one of y'all, and you belong to me, and, and this is what I want to create in these books, uh, and it's not about masculine and feminine, and it's not about north or south, it's about us being human beings together. And uh, that's what I, that's my goal. It's going to be my goal with this series, is how can we be human beings together caring about one another. Something I'd like to put in with sure. that is uh, uh, there are different things that, well, they like politics or religion that people have definite ideas on and they think they should not talk about those things mm -hmm. to other people. Mm -hmm. And my thing has been, my thinking is, we should be able to talk about these different things with different people you know, not as uh, to fight or anything, but to learn from other people. Brittany Brown would agree with you. <laughs> and see, this is how I brought that I wanted to have this book handy, is because one of the things that was really powerful for me is she addressed that issue that you're talking about right there. And I cannot remember because I need to go and relearn her, her, her idea of how we could have those conversations so we can learn from our differences in compassion. You know, and so that we can still live together and have differences, but not do this fighting that we're doing right now. And so if you get a chance, I, I, this might not be your kind of reading, uh, just uh, email me and uh, I'll go find it in my copy where I underlined it for you. <laughs> but it really, she really does give uh, great ideas of how in our communities we can have these hard, uh, hard conversations of differences and still remain human beings together where I get to be me and you get to be you, and we live here. I cannot resist the bad pun. Every time somebody says human beings, all I can think of is human beings. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And now, uh, oh, you know, we're all beans in the same pot. That's right. I kind of like it in a different way. We each want to be accepted for who we are. That's right. Mm -hmm. And as we are. Um, that's, that's, that's everybody's goal, to be accepted. And so for, for me and my belief, if I'm going to be accepted for who I am, um, who am I not to accept others as that's they right. are? That's right. That's right. And, you know, uh, when you're saying that, it reminds me, um, I am a musician first, of course, and one of the songs that has come around to me as I've gotten older, that the more I hear it, the more I'm like, oh, this should just be my life. Let it be. Let it be, let it be. Yeah. You know, if I let myself be, I'm okay, I belong. If it, and I can let you be too, and I can let you be, and you be, you know? Mm -hmm. That makes sense. And, uh, so that's good. I'm glad y'all brought both of those things up, because they're, they're good analogies and metaphors and ways that we can learn to be together. Thank y'all for coming tonight. I don't have any, I mean, y'all have any more questions I, or thoughts? When's the next book come out? I don't know. <laughs> uh, you know, I don't, since you said that, I'm going to mention that what's really neat about this book is I was writing a short story, 
and all of a sudden my characters took over <laughs> and they had a different way and then we were on outs for a couple of years and because I wanted them to go this way and they wanted to go that way <laughs> and so finally I decided to go with what I was feeling was the right way to go and the characters flew uh, you know the writing uh, uh, flowed is what I should say and already the characters are starting to talk to me about where to begin the next uh, book. So, so thank you for asking that question because it was, it was really interesting process to write fiction. Um, There's also a way if you want the characters to be just like they were. That's right. Oh. See, this is how come I always kind of go to her for spiritual questions. She always tells me what I don't want to hear and need to hear. <laughs> like the characters talk to you they sort of live and they're and they sort of talk to you and they form and fill out until they're ready to be put down oh I'm glad we actually have all these creative people here because that's the creative process mm -hmm. don't you think uh -huh. you know you stew on things a, a bit like yeah. uh, you know David's got an idea for something he wants to build and it, it's there he's just got to stew on it a little bit longer and in his is, is a visual art but the written art, you, you gotta, you gotta do the same process. You gotta mm -hmm. stew on it a little bit. Yeah. And I would think even with your teaching, uh, speech pathology stuff, sometimes you have to stew on a problem in order to figure out how. I stew on a lot of problems. <laughs> <laughs> in, in order to solve them, well, don't we all stew on a lot of problems? <laughs> Well, the best way to solve any kind of an artistic thing is to do something completely different. Mm -hmm. yep. yes. right. When reset. I was stuck on a design problem, yep. I'd get my truck and just start driving. Mm -hmm. yep. And by the time I came back, there was the answer. Mm -hmm. yep. Mm -hmm. yep. And didn't even think about it. It just happened. Yeah. Good point. And everybody's saying, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what I do with the wire and the stones because I make jewelry. And I, I let them inform me as to what they want. And if I try to put them away, they don't want to go. It doesn't go together. I forgot you had said. I forgot you had. Said. Yes, I. Yeah. So it's it's kind of the same thing. The characters live. They live within you until they're ready to come forth. Yeah. So, well, thank y'all for coming out. And again, if you have more questions, we can just talk after talk afterwards. So thank you for coming. Thank you. I love y'all. God bless you. <laughs> Oh, let's turn this thing off. Bye. <laughs> Here I am.